Did you ever hear a preacher say, Repent, or turn from your sins to be saved? The Bible says, Unless you repent, you will perish. Unless you turn from your sin, you're going to burn in hell. Once you accept Jesus into your life, once you repent of your sins, first you have to be willing to repent of your sin. You've got to repent of all your sin. So what you've got to do, Justin, is repent of your sins. Are you sure that the preacher you have heard say this preaches the right gospel? Just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. The danger of believing that you don't need to repent from your sins to be saved is that you never end up becoming converted or born again. Even if you find yourself in serious sin, yes, go right to God and apologize. Like, repent of your sins. Confess your sins to God. That is, we do that. If someone asked you to show me in the Bible where it says, repent of your sins to be saved, could you open your Bible and show the verse? Say that in Luke 24? I'm just asking you. Does it no, say that? No, it doesn't. So it doesn't say repent of sins for, for repent for forgiveness of sins? Some people will say that the exact phrase, repent of sins, isn't mentioned anywhere in the Bible. But this couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, yes, the exact wording repent from sins isn't found in scripture but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you let him be accursed as we said before so say i now again if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received let him be accursed If someone asked you, what is the definition of repentance, how would you define it? What is repentance? First of all, we need to define what repentance is not. Repentance is not a work. Repentance, essentially, the word means a change of mind. To repent of sin, specifically. Sin, uh, according to 1 John 3, 4, says, uh, sin is transgression of the law. So to repent of your sin means you change your mind about breaking God's law. According to Jesse Morell, the definition of repentance is to change your mind about sin, that is, changing your mind about breaking God's law. But it is not a work. Some people will say that the exact phrase, repent of sins, isn't mentioned anywhere in the Bible. But this couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, yes, the exact wording, repent from sins, isn't found in Scripture. But as I'm about to show you, the word repent is absolutely used in the context of turning from sin. In Acts 26.20, it says they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Epiusion Apologetics also defines repentance as changing your mind about sin, except that he interpreted it to say that it is a work. So we see that repentance is a change of intention. And that's why the Bible says in multiple places that we ought to prove our repentance with our deeds. It's because repentance itself isn't a work, it's just an intention to do that work. And so if you don't go and do that work, so if we don't see that works, it just shows that the repentance was not genuine when it happened in the first place. Is that repentance is a turning from all known sin. According to Hal Chafee, Again, repentance means to change your mind about sin. But he didn't say that it is not a work, or that it is a work, but rather it is an intention to work. But be very careful, said Jesus. Because if you do not repent, you too will all perish. Repentance is the daily work of the Christian. According to Alistair Begg, repentance is the daily work of the Christian. You say, well, Billy, what, what really do I have to do? First, you have to be willing to repent of your sin. 
You say, well, what does that mean? That means to change your way of living, to change your thinking about Christ and about God and about yourself. It means to live a new kind of a life. It means that you're willing to give up some of those wrong things in your life and walk with him. That's repentance. And then the second thing, you must receive him by faith. But as many as received him to them, give you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Just simple faith. According to Billy Graham, repentance, by which he means turning from sin, is the first thing you must do. While believing in Christ, having faith, is the second thing you must do to enter the kingdom of heaven. There are many other people we could look to, to get their definition of repentance, but we seem to be getting mixed messages. Is repentance a work, or is it not a work? Is it the first thing we do, before we believe, to become a Christian, or is it the daily work of somebody who is already a Christian? But perhaps you are wondering, of course there are inconsistent definitions out there about what it means to repent. After all, Paul warned us about false gospels, so of course anybody preaching a false gospel is going to have an incorrect definition of repentance. Let's examine some of the different gospels that are out there and how this affects the definition of repentance. There are a lot of non-denominational standalone Christians on social media that are typically not part of large churches. Believing that so much of Christianity is given over to error, they usually act alone or fellowship only in very small numbers of other like-minded people. Because they often act alone or in very small numbers and do not claim a denominational name, this is a very broad category and it is difficult to put a label on them. More often than not, they tend to believe in Arminian doctrines of salvation, although they won't necessarily claim that label. Namely, faith and works, that salvation is not by faith alone, saving faith must be accompanied by works, and conditional security, that a saved person can lose their salvation. They won't all profess sinless perfectionism, but that is usually the general direction of their doctrine. They are often very vague about the line between being saved and losing salvation, but will often state that even one sin is enough to cause you to lose your salvation. Because there are so many of these types of people, it would be impossible to name them all. We can only name a few people here. Michaela Cooper Jeff Olet Why City Preachers one Reality Warning the People Jesse Morell Gabe the Street Preacher JPD Adam Young Epiusium Apologetics Chip Lutic Hal Chaffee and far too many others to mention. Because many of them act alone, they may not even agree with many others in this same category that have very similar beliefs. A few of them may have very radical beliefs that really puts them in their own category, but they probably still agree with conditional security and faith plus works. A prime example of this would be Mike Rakowski. He also professes conditional security and sinless perfectionism, but having Pentecostal influences that he picked up from reading Smith Wigglesworth's writings, he has formulated his own doctrines on salvation. When you repent, that is to turn from your sins, and accept Jesus into your life, this is only the beginning of a difficult sanctification journey you must undertake. The end goal is to become a sanctified in truth disciple of Christ, who has learned to overcome sickness and sin, and is able to communicate with Jesus and test the spirits. Upon achieving this goal, it is impossible for you to sin or get sick. While most people interpret being born again as the beginning of the journey, or perhaps the journey itself, Rakowski interprets it as being the end of the journey, when you have finally achieved the status of being sanctified in truth. Most believers will start their journey, but will never finish it, falling for the devil's lies and eventually rejecting God's truth. In doing so, they will lose their salvation 
but also blasphemed the Holy Spirit, being unredeemable after that point. However, he also proclaims that some believers, out of sheer ignorance, will never be confronted with this truth. So despite continuing in sin, and therefore not being born again, they will still enter heaven, because they never had the chance to deny truth and blaspheme the Spirit. This doctrine is so specific and unique to him, and a handful of people who have been convinced by his testimony and teaching, that it doesn't have a name or an ism to describe it. A more prominent view that is more widely accepted in evangelical Christianity is that of Calvinism, which is Reformed theology, and Lordship Salvation. Lordshippers may or may not be Calvinist, and may even reject these labels, but they won't necessarily divide over the specifics about predestination, and are arguably more closely aligned with the beliefs of Calvinism rather than Arminianism. Whether they agree with the label Lordship Salvation or not, the general premise of their gospel is this. Faith alone, but faith is never alone. They will say that we are saved by faith alone, not of works. But if it is a true saving faith, it will produce works as the fruit of faith. If there are no works, it is evident that there is no genuine faith. If they do agree with Calvinism, then of course they will agree with perseverance of the saints. The view that a true born-again believer will persevere in the faith to the very end not just in faith, but also in works. They usually reject sinless perfectionism, acknowledging that a true believer may backslide into sin, but will always get back up on their feet if they are truly saved. Failing to do so confirms they were never truly saved to begin with. Because they usually reject sinless perfectionism, but they do believe that a true saving faith will produce works of obedience, the line between stumbling into sin and making a lifestyle practice of sin is rather vague and arbitrary. One of their catchy gospel phrases is, you must surrender to Christ's lordship to be saved, although they won't all use this terminology. It should be noted that while lordship salvation is typically associated with Calvinism, there are lordshippers who swing more to Arminianism, or a combination of both. Despite their differences, they may still generally agree with one another, working together and quoting each other in their writings. Lordshippers don't usually claim this label for themselves. Rather, they are given this label, derogatively, by Christians holding the free grace or easy believism position. But in any case, their views on the gospel are more prevalent among the more famous Christian preachers and evangelists, being more widely accepted in Protestant and Evangelical Christianity, particularly in Reformed circles. As before, there are too many names to mention them all, we can only list a few here, and some of these men may even resent being put on this list. Francis Chan, Tim Conway, Billy Graham, Franklin Graham, Justin Peters, Dr. Brown, Paul Washer, John MacArthur, John Piper, Ray Comfort, Kirk Cameron and the Living Waters Ministry, Alistair Begg, Steve Lawson, Charles Lawson, and many more that can't be mentioned here. Perhaps you agree with some of the people mentioned in these lists. You believe some of them preach the correct biblical gospel. If that is the case, you probably agree then that the gospels I am about to list are definitely false. The first one that comes to mind is the gospel of Catholicism and Orthodoxy. The belief that we have to confess our sins to the priest to maintain our salvation and keep our state of grace, among other practices, and praying to Mary as an intercessor. Mike Schmitz of Ascension Presents and Trent Horn are well-known Catholic podcasters, among others. Then we have the Seventh-day Adventists, who believe in the keeping of the Saturday Sabbath as a requirement for salvation. Bible Flockbox is one of the most popular Christian vloggers on social media and is a Seventh-day Adventist. The Jehovah's Witnesses, believing that Jesus did not bodily resurrect, set their own requirements. Studying the Bible intently and being part of their organisation are prerequisites 
to being saved onto eternal life. And then of course we have the Mormons, who have a very hardcore works-based salvation and have beliefs which are frankly considered utterly ludicrous to most other Christians. Outside of Christianity, religions such as Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam and Judaism also have merit-based patterns of salvation. There are many other Gospels of salvation out there, but time would not permit me to mention all of them. Their Gospel messages do indeed vary, so their finer details about repentance will also vary. Nevertheless, there is one consistent recurring theme that is being found across all of their messages. That repentance means to turn from your sins and or surrender yourself in some way, these being necessary steps to complete your salvation and inherit eternal life. There are many false teachers out there teaching that repentance does not mean turning from sins. First, you have to be willing to repent of your sin. What is repentance? It's to turn from sin. Oh, sinners, seek the Lord. Repent of all your sin. Isn't that good? No, you don't get prepared for it. You repent. What does that mean? It's a turning from sin. That's what it is. And faith alone in Jesus Christ is preceded and followed by repentance. A turning away from sin. But you weren't saved by a magic formula or some words you repeated after someone else. You were saved because you repented of your sins. He uses that word nobody likes, repent. Repent. Not only confess your sin, forsake your sin, repent, run away from it. Then Jesus comes up afterwards. I get messages from people from time to time which tell me that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you need to repent from your sins to be saved. But that's just simply not true. Well, no, you got to repent, turn from all sin. No lying, stealing, adultery, fornication, homosexuality. you got to turn from all sin. There are two things you have to do to be saved. You must repent. Not just ask Jesus into your heart, but turn from all sin. No. The Bible says unless you repent, you will perish. Unless you turn from your sin, you're going to burn in hell. That real... Biblical repentance is a complete renunciation of all sin and a full intention to obey the commandments of Jesus. There are many false teachers out there teaching that repentance does not mean turning from sins. Just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Even if you find yourself in serious sin, yes, go right to God and apologize. Like, repent of your sins. Confess your sins to God. That is we do that, but we also recognize that we're called to go to the priest. Watch. See, friends, it's not about us accepting Jesus. It's not about us accepting Jesus. It's about Jesus accepting you. And he's only going to accept those who repent and forsake all known sin, turn away from all their iniquity and all their transgressions, and turn to Jesus Christ. That is the only way that the Lord will accept you. You, but when you're you're repented of your sins, you've been forgiven by Jesus Christ, you don't look forward to sinning. You look forward to going out and evangelizing on Friday night. You look I use repentance as turning from sin because that is where we messed up. Everybody is separated from God because of sin. Without repentance from sin, wicked man cannot have fellowship with a holy God. Look, you need to repent of your sins, pal. If you're not really seeking the Lord on your knees every day in prayer and reading His Word, then you're not ever going to get to full surrender. You're not ever going to be reborn because you're still holding on to some sin and still holding on to your flesh. Is to repent, to turn from your sin. Confess your sins. Confess and forsake your sins. And that they are in need of repenting of that sin and placing their faith in Christ. So what are you repenting of? Your sin. My friends, we have to repent for our sin. We have to lay aside the wickedness and the filthiness and the superfluousness, I can't say that word, of the flesh. There are many false teachers out there teaching that repentance does not mean turning from sins. I believe that you know, we need to believe on Jesus, we need to repent of our sins. They 
that, that their works, that they turned from their evil way, when God saw those works, he gave them mercy. It was their works that brought about mercy. It was their turning from sin, their repentance that saved them. The faith in Jesus Christ is a repentant faith in a turning toward God, turning away from sin and turning to God in faith by faith in Jesus Christ. And when the Book of Common Prayer in the Church of England says, all those who truly repent of their sins are welcome to the table of the Lord. This is what it means. And the only way you can be reconciled to that God is through coming to the mediator who is Christ and <clears throat> repenting of your sins. This is going to be an instructional video on uh, how to repent of all your sins. Once you accept Jesus into your life, once you repent of your sins and you say, you know, Jesus, I accept you as your, my Lord and Savior. I, I ask for your Holy Spirit. God expects that whenever you get saved, you're supposed to get saved by what? Repenting. And repenting means turning from sin. So that means that if you turn from your sins and you put your trust in Jesus, God will forgive you. Today is the opportunity of your life. Repent of your sins and say that Jesus is your Savior. It's by grace that I'm saved, but I'm saved when I understand how beautiful He is and surrender everything to Him. I want to lead you in a very simple prayer of surrendering your life to the Lord Jesus and allowing Him. Lord Jesus, today I surrender my whole life to you. There are many false teachers out there teaching that repentance does not mean turning from sins. Repentance, this idea of turning from sin uh, and faith, turning to Christ, and they happen together, right? They're, they, they're, they're inseparable. But he wants you to repent and be born again, John 3. And he wants, he wants you to leave your former sinful life behind. Let the Holy Spirit write his laws in your heart, Jeremiah 31, verse 33, that, that's a prophecy of the new covenant, and strive to live like he did. Sure, you'll fall short, but you have to try. That is the first part of the gospel, repent, and then believe the good news. When they were being convicted, repent and receive the power to overcome their sin. Repent and receive the power to overcome their sin. When a person repents of their sin, they have a change of mind. That change of mind is going to result in a change of direction, a change of conduct, a change of behavior in their life. A person who has changed their mind about, and, and we're talking about their view towards sin and towards Christ, because what you're turning from is sin and offending Christ, and you're turning to Christ. I repented when I gave my heart to Jesus, and so did you. You repented totally of your sins and said, Lord, take all your past sins you laid before the Lord. Repentance means to change the way you think. Change the pattern of your life that is destructive to you. It happens when we turn from sins, turn from sins, repent. They have never truly repented. They have never really changed their mind. They've never really made a decision. They've never really surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus in their lives. And repentance, remember, means to exercise the mind in the midst of the situation, not to sin and to do what's right. There are many false teachers out there teaching that repentance does not mean turning from sins. Are you ready to truly repent, to fall to your knees before the Lord Jesus, to repent of your sins and to change your ways? The reason you keep sinning is because you're not perfectly repenting. To repent is to turn from your sin. Repentance for its bad rap. Repentance is just a really sweet surrender. Repentance should be one of the most popular words in the Bible because it means turning away from evil and turning to goodness. It means breaking the chains of sin and living a life of freedom and joy and happiness that Christ came to give us. Repentance is turning from our sin and faith is placing our hope in Jesus as our Savior. This implies two parts, turning away from sin and returning to the Lord. 
he is talking about the repentance for sins so that we can be saved. At the heart of the Christian life is repentance, metanoia, turning away from our sins. First, he wants everyone to repent of their sins, change their lives around, and trust in Jesus Christ. Repentance is a turning away from sin and a turning to God. It's a change of heart and mind that produces a change of life. You were dead and you're made alive. The sodomite that repents of his sins and trusts in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's a turning. It's a change. A change of direction. A change of desire. And it's a turning away from a life pursuit of sin. I think the confusion is when people think repentance means living perfectly. That, that would be works, right? Repentance isn't even a work. It's an attitude change. It's a heart change. I'm turning from sin to God in my heart. There are many false teachers out there teaching that repentance does not mean turning from sins. If you turn from your sin, if you leave the drunkenness, the sex outside of marriage, the pornography, all of that, you say, I'm leaving that behind, but follow after Jesus Christ. He promises to forgive you. I don't know. I'd say repent and believe the gospel. Make sure that your faith is real. Contemplate your sin and the holiness of God and turn from your sin to Christ and cast yourself only on Him. What is repentance? Repentance is that sinner forsakes his sin, that the sinner forsakes his sin, puts it out of his thoughts and fully resolves in his mind that he will never do it again. So Jesus repent. said to repent, right? Yeah, but you don't have to repent of your sins to be saved. Okay. Nowhere does the Bible say to repent of your sins to be saved. That's a works-based salvation. Does it say that in Luke 24? I'm just asking you. Does it no, say that? No, it doesn't. So it doesn't say repent of sins for, for repent for forgiveness of sins? It does not say that, no. That's what not is it, what it says. What does it say in Luke 24? It just says that repentance okay. and the forgiveness of sins should be preached. Our, our sins, you know, if we did something wrong, if we said something wrong, or thought something wrong, it is our job to correct that and not someone else's. So when we do repentance, we're kind of just saying out loud what we thought did or said wrong. At least when I think about repentance, I think of it as like a big deal. I need to have a broken heart and a contrite spirit and I need to have that change of heart. I need to feel that sorrow and that guilt and be ready to change my life and, and give up that sin and stop doing it. But in our tradition, the real repentance is to stop doing the wrong thing and start doing the right thing. But correct it. And if you do, sin no more. And that's what even Jesus used to tell in his congregation. Sin no more. Repent. And if you do, change your way of life. Today we're going to talk about repentance. Why is it so hard for us to change our bad habits and defilements? such as quitting smoking, stop arguing with our spouses, stop being bitter, and jealous, and angry. It's because we haven't learned how to truly repent. Give us sincere repentance and complete repentance for all of our sins before the death rattle uh, comes upon us. Simply by surrendering to me completely, giving up all other popular notions, popular religious traditions, just by completely surrendering oneself to Shri Krishna, all the sinful reactions are destroyed and also the sinning propensity is destroyed. And you're going to make an effort in not doing that again now. So it doesn't mean that you make a game out of it. So this whole sense of forgiveness, it's not that you're forgiven by doing a particular seva, it's not that you're forgiven because you do a particular act, it's because you surrendered and you say to the Guru, I fall at your feet and I've lost and I need you now. And the Guru says, I'll take you in, but now I want you at least to have the intention that you're going to make an effort to walk on that straight path now. I'm going to help you, the Guru will say. Chuba has two stages. The first stage is basically repenting. It's basically regretting the sin that you did. And the second stage is not repeating that sin. Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? His kindness is intended to turn you from your sins. There are many false teachers out there teaching that repentance does not mean turning from sins. Metanoia simply means what Teshuvah does, to repent, to turn away from sin, 
towards God. The repentance is to turn, to turn away from sin towards God. You only get to heaven because you confess your sin. There must be the repentance of sin. Repentance is a lifestyle. It's not a one-time deal. It's not something that you just do when you get saved. It's a lifestyle. Every day, the closer I get to God, He keeps showing me I'm a jacked up joker. Repentance is not just feeling sorry about your sin. It's feeling sorry enough to change. A lot of people aren't willing to go to that next step. When somebody understands the consequence of sin is death, they, because it's a gift of God, can turn from their sins, not in perfection, but in a new direction. You gotta turn from what you love. You gotta turn from your sins. You gotta count the cost, okay? And if you love your sin, you're not, look, you're not hungering and thirsting after righteousness. I do most earnestly repent of my transgressions. Many youth in the church doesn't really know who God is and ne has never really repented of their sins and has never really been born again because... Well, like Paul, we've repented over our past sins. We've confessed them to the extent necessary. So we can be sure, too, that Jehovah will be merciful with us. We cannot go on sinning. We cannot have a sinful lifestyle. If we sin, we ask forgiveness and He's faithful and righteous to forgive us. But if our life is a sinful lifestyle, then we have a nature of sin and go on sinning and can sin without being totally destroyed and condemned and, and, and repent and run away from it, uh, then we're not born again. There are many false teachers out there teaching that repentance there false does not mean turning from sin. There are many false teachers out there teaching that repentance does not mean turning from sin. There does not mean turning from sin. There are many false teachers out there teaching that repentance does not mean turning from sin. In fairness, just because a lot of false religion and false denominations of Christianity proclaim a common belief, this doesn't automatically make it wrong. Most denominations of Christianity, however orthodox or heterodox, generally agree that Jesus died, was buried, and in some fashion rose again. It would be very unusual to proclaim oneself as a believing Christian and not believe in this basic tenet. Christians who take their faith seriously argue and condemn one another over various salvation issues. Faith alone or faith and works, eternal security or conditional security, predestination or free will, with or without the Catholic sacraments. But they don't typically disagree about the death, burial and resurrection of Christ, except over some details with a handful of heterodox groups, so-called, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses. With passages such as 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4, it would be very difficult to deny this foundation while professing to believe the Bible, namely that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Perhaps then, repenting of sins is equally as foundational to the Christian gospel as the death, burial and resurrection of Christ. After all, just as the scriptures speak of his death, burial and resurrection repeatedly, so do they also speak repeatedly about repentance, appearing in at least 56 verses in the New Testament. However, the death, burial and resurrection of Christ is fairly self-explanatory. His death means one thing. His burial means one thing. His resurrection means one thing. But as we have already seen, we have mixed messages when it comes to a strict definition of repentance. One person says that it is a work. Another person says that it is not a work. One person says that it is the first thing you must do before you believe. Another says it is the ongoing lifestyle after you believe. Others will say it is a surrender. Why can't somebody just give us a simple definition of repentance? Why does it take paragraphs of articles and emotionally embellished sermons 
to explain one little word. Perhaps defining repentance as turning from your sins so as to be saved is causing this confusion in the first place. Look up in a concordance, which I did, the word repent, and look up repentance, repenting, repented, and repenteth. Those are the different ways repent is used in the Bible. And I found that it appears 112 times in all. Now, in my concordance, it doesn't appear that many times, about 105. In Strong's hardback, it only appears 111 times. But if you take the time to actually count them yourself, it appears 112 times in the King James Bible. Now, all references to repent of sins, repented of sins, or repentance from sin. What we're going to do, we're going to take our computer. We're going to type in parentheses, repent of sins, close parentheses, repented of sins, repentance from sin. So every time the Bible uses one of those phrases, we're going to find it and study it, see what it's got to say. So we will open our Bibles and we'll go through and find all those verses where it says that what happened to them. Surely they must be in there somewhere. There's got to be, sorry, what? The phrase you're looking for cannot be found. It's not in the Bible, none of those phrases. Okay, there are 105 times in the King James Bible, or 105 verses, that is, that use the word repentance. Does the Bible ever even use the term repent of your sins? Not one time. Not one time in this entire big, thick Bible of 1189 chapters does the Bible ever say repent of your sins. The words repent of your sins are not found once in the Bible. Does the Bible really say repent? or repentance so many times and yet never say repent of your sins one time. Surely this cannot be true. But we know that that's what repentance means. Surely this is something that the Bible says over and over again. Now the mistake that most people make is that whenever they see the word repent in the Bible, they add these magical words after it, of your sins. So whenever they see the word repent, they just automatically add of sin, repent of sin. And in fact, they often think that just the word repent means to turn from sin. And there's a problem, yeah. Whenever they see the word repent, whenever they see the word repent, these people, they just automatically add of your sin, don't they? You mean the term repent of sin doesn't appear in the Bible? Never, not once. Repent from sin? Not once. Then where did it come from? Religion. God didn't say it. Apostles never said it. It's a made up doctrine. Not once. Repent of sins is not in the Bible. We need to test the claims being made here. We should be able to open our Bible, find the verses that mention repentance, and see if they say, of your sins. Because there are so many verses that use this word, we cannot quote them all so the most commonly quoted passages regarding salvation will be considered. Matthew 3 verses 1 and 2 In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Notice, it doesn't say, of your sins. Matthew 11 verse 21 Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Notice that this verse does not say, repented of their sins. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. This verse does not say, repent of your sins. Mark chapter 6 verse 12 And they went out and preached that men should repent. It does not say, of their sins. Luke chapter 3 verse 8 Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, 
that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Notice it did not say repentance from sins. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptised every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Peter did not say, Repent of your sins. Acts chapter 11 verse 18 When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. It does not say repentance of sins. Acts chapter 17 verse 30 And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. It does not say, Repent of their sins. Acts chapter 19 verse 4 Then said Paul, John verily baptised with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. It does not say, Baptism of repentance for sins. Acts chapter 20 verse 21 Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. It does not say, Repentance of sins. Acts 26 verse 20 But showed first unto them of Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, and turn to God, and do works meet for repentance. It does not say repent of their sins. Romans chapter 2 verse 4 or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. It does not say, of your sins. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. It does not say, repentance from sins. 2 Timothy 2 verse 25 in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance, to the acknowledging of the truth. It does not say repentance from sins. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1, Therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God. It does not say repentance from sins. 2 Peter 3 verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It does not say, repentance from their sins. But wait, the repent of your sins messengers will not put down their weapons yet. They are not without ammunition. Mark 1 verse 4 John did baptise in the wilderness, and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Luke chapter 3 verse 3 and he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Matthew chapter 9 verse 13, Mark chapter 2 verse 17, and Luke chapter 5 verse 32. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke chapter 13 verses 4 to 5. All those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Luke chapter 24 verse 47 And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Acts chapter 8 verse 22 Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 21 And lest, when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many which have sinned already, and have not repented, of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. Revelation 2 verses 21 to 22 And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Revelation 9 verses 20 to 21 And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, 
and idols of gold, and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Revelation 16 verse 11 And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. It is important to note that none of the latter verses quoted say repent of your sins. They say either repentance for the remission of sins, sinners in the noun form, to repentance in the noun form. Repent or you shall perish. Repent that your sins may be blotted out. Repent of this thy wickedness. They repented not of a specific list of sins. I gave her space to repent of her fornication. Except they repent, or they repented not, of their deeds, or the works of their hands. Perhaps you are now wondering, isn't this just arguing over semantics? Is this not playing word games? These verses prove that turning from sin was the repentance required. So surely, we then apply that every time we see repentance, even if sin is not directly mentioned. This sounds logical to most people, but there are some fundamental problems with this. Now, what's interesting is that the person who repents more than anyone else in the Bible is God. The prophets, like a preacher appealing to a drunk, said to God, repent. <laughs> That's strange. And he did. In Exodus 32, verse 12, it says, Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath. This is Moses speaking to God. Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. So we can see that repent means to turn, right? Moses is telling God to turn away from his anger or wrath toward his people. It says in verse 13, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. Watch this. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Now that right there proves that repenting does not mean repent of your sins. Because God doesn't have any sins. God never has sinned. God is perfect in every way. And yet, did God repent in this scripture? Yeah. Yes, he did. He turned. He turned from one course of action unto another. He didn't turn from sin. He turned from anger. He turned from his wrath. He turned from the judgment that he was going to pour out. Now, the Bible speaks of God repenting 39 times the number of books in the Old Testament. Did you know God repents? How could he ask you to repent if he hadn't repented? God, God repents. Sometimes he repents. Sometimes he doesn't repent. He said he won't repent. And he said he has repented. In Genesis chapter 6, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination and thought of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he'd made man on the earth. Now you know the context of that. God sees Noah down there. And he looks at the rest of the world and he says, I'm sorry I made him. What does God do when he's sorry he made him? When he repents that he made man, he kills them all. He killed everyone up except for Noah and his family. So that's what it means for God to repent. He repented of having made man. In Numbers 23 and verse 19, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor, neither the son of man that he should repent. He hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? So when it's talking about this, it's talking about the fact that, hey, he gave you a gift, and he said it's eternal, he can't lie. But you know what, people have taken this verse and be like, wow, God repents? Yeah, he does. But you know what, he won't. There's certain things he can't repent on, right? Because it's impossible for God to lie. Because in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, promised before the world began. So if he gives you a gift of eternal life, guess what? He can't repent from that. He can't lie about it. Because he's not a man, he's not, he's not gonna sin, okay? 1 Samuel 15, it repenteth me that I've set up Saul to be king. People wanted a king, God didn't. They said, we will have a king. God said, okay, I'll appoint you one. God appointed Saul. But God said after he saw how Saul was acting, I'm sorry I did it. It repenteth me that I've set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, has not performed my commandments, and Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented 
that he made Saul king over Israel. So what did God do when he repented he made Saul king over Israel? He appointed another king, David. David took Saul's place. So God made a decision to choose Saul to be the first king of Israel. But then later, because of the way Saul behaved, he repented of having made Saul king. Is that repenting of sin? No, because God has no sin. So we see that there's a different type of repentance in the Bible. People can turn from all manner of things. They can turn from anger. They can turn from a decision that they had made. Repentance is not a religious word. It's a secular word. It's a word that's used in the Bible, but it's also used many other places. The problem with our terminology in Christianity is that we take words that are in the Bible and they become very popular doctrinally to us, which is fine, but they fall out of use in the secular circle because they have such a connotation in the religious circle. So if you use the word repent on the news, they automatically think you're preaching or something. So people don't often use it anymore because it has such a religious connotation. The problem is the religious connotation is inaccurate and not true to the Bible. So repentance is first a secular word describing a complete turnaround on any stated issue. If you decide to buy a cherry popsicle and you get there, pick it up, and then you change your mind and you say, I want grape, then you repented and you bought the grape instead. That would be a very proper use of the word. The context defines the nature of repentance in regard to the subject. In other words, the context tells you what you're turning from and what you're turning to. You're turning from the cherry popsicle to the grape popsicle. That's the repentance. Now, there is a man-to-man -man repentance out of the 112 times that the word repent, repenteth, repentance, repenting uh, appears in the Bible. But go to Exodus chapter 13. This is an interesting one. Exodus chapter 13, this is where the children of Israel are leaving Egypt where they've been in bondage. And, you know, they're going to cross the Red Sea, of course. They're going to head for the Promised Land. Eventually, they're going to end up wandering in the wilderness. But look what the Bible says in Exodus 13, verse 17. It says, And it came to pass, this is when they're first leaving Egypt, it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt. Now look, God wanted the people to leave Egypt, didn't he? Yes. Did he want them to turn around and go back to Egypt? No. Absolutely not. So here, these people aren't repenting of their sin. They're repenting to sin if they turn back. He says, look, if they see war, if they go through the land of the Philistines, they're going to repent and go back to Egypt. So in this case, repentance is not even a good thing. Judges 21, now the men of Israel had sworn in Mizpeth, saying, There shall not any of us give his daughter unto Benjamin to wife. They'd had a fallen out with the tribe of Benjamin because uh, the tribe of Benjamin had killed a visiting woman, uh, sexually abused her, and when Israel went down and said, turn these men over to us, they said, no, this is a sanctuary city. You're not going to be allowed to prosecute this individual. We have uh, set him free. And so they went to war against them and killed the tribe off down to just a few hundred men, five or six hundred, I think. And that's all that was left. And so the tribe was going to perish because they had no wives. So they said, we're not going to give them any of our wives. They cannot marry any of our women. That means the tribe is going to die out, cease to exist. The children of Israel then repented them for Benjamin, their brother, repented of saying, you can't have any of our wives. There's one tribe cut off from Israel this day. How shall we do for wives for them that remain? Seeing we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them to our, of our daughters to wives. So that's a dilemma. Uh, you know how that worked out. And they said, we can't give you our daughters. So they took a bunch of uh, young maidens that were of maritable age, and they had them go down the road, all kind of dancing along and prancing. And they told these uh, Benjamites that they could hide in the bushes and steal them a woman. And so that's what they did. They all came out and snatched them one and uh, carried them off, and that was their wives. So that's how. Now, the girls volunteered for that thing, you know. It's probably the ugly ones. 
And uh, I don't know what it was. But they ended up getting wives anyhow. So their repentance, they, they couldn't actually go through the normal processes. So they repented and let them have wives after all. That's a man-to-man repentance. Matthew 21, what think ye? A certain man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, go to work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. Lazy bum. Must have had some of those video games. I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. Because his mama told me he wasn't getting any supper if he didn't go. So he repented and went. That's nothing to do with God. I'm showing you that the word repent, even in the Bible, is used in a secular context. It's not a word isolated to, the, to religion or Bible doctrine. Paul says, quote, I do not repent. He said, I did, but I don't anymore. Oh, that's, Paul, that's heresy. What's wrong with you? Get a hard heart. Look at the verse. For though I made you sorry with a letter, Paul wrote a letter to Corinth, I do not repent of having written the letter, though I did repent. He said, after I wrote it, I was sorry I wrote it. Changed my mind. I said, go back and get that letter. Don't deliver it. But it already delivered. And then I saw what it did. It, it, it changed you. So now I don't repent of what I did repent of. Had nothing, <laughs> had nothing to do with God or religion, faith or sin. It had to do with writing a letter. So the bottom line is, as we look at these scripts, it becomes obvious that a person can repent from anything. They can repent from something good. They can repent of something bad. They can repent of a decision that they made. It's just a turning or changing course or changing direction. It doesn't have to be repenting of your sins. Most of the verses about God repenting are in the Old Testament from the underlying Hebrew word nachem. This word is not typically used to describe repenting from sin for which perhaps the word shub is more commonly used. One notable exception is Jeremiah 8.6, which does use Nachum to refer to man's repentance from sin. Most of the verses in the New Testament where repentance is not about sin and not explicitly about salvation either, use the Greek word metamelome. This is equivalent to the Hebrew word Nachum because Hebrew 7.21 quotes it from Psalm 110.4 as metamelome. However, when repentance in the New Testament is clearly about sin or about salvation, the Greek word metaneo, the verb, or metanoia, the noun, is predominantly used in the appropriate verses. Should we then assume that repentance, when translated from these words, always means to turn from sin, and this is a requirement for salvation? Here are three verses that use the same underlying Hebrew word nachem in reference to God repenting. The Jeremiah and Genesis verses cited use the same form of the word. In the Greek translations of the Old Testament, this Hebrew word is translated as both metamelome and metaneo, depending on the verse. In Genesis 6-7, it's translated as metamelethin, a variant of metamelome. In Jeremiah 4-28, it's translated as metanoiso, a variant of metaneo. And in Jonah 3.10, it's translated as metanoisin, another variant of metaneo. Why would the same Hebrew word, which does not predominantly mean to turn from sin, be translated as both metaneo and metamelome, if metaneo is supposed to be a different kind of repentance that does mean turning from sin? Do Greeks not understand their native language enough to be able to translate properly? Maybe instead, the claims that these words amount to different kinds of repentance are false. Like the Hebrew word nachem and the Greek word metamelome, metanoia and metaneo are not different kinds of repentance. They do not automatically mean to turn from all sin every time the words are used. Therefore, we need context to understand what is being repented to, repented of, or repented from. This term is obviously abused and used by false prophets, typically using the book of Acts, okay? Anytime you have someone who believes that they, you have to repent of your sins to be saved, and you have to repent of your sins in order to have salvation, they typically always point to Acts 2.38. And not just Acts 2.38, they often go to many passages in the book of Acts to try to prove this false doctrine. You can tell them, hey, where does it say that you have to repent of your sin? to be saved. And they'll say, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, 
in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you say, well, I know that it says that, but where does it say you have to repent of your sin to be saved? It says it right there, repent and be baptized. It's like they're so blinded and they believe this false doctrine so much that they insert that term into the text. Now there's actually two false doctrines that are taught using this portion of scripture. Let's go through both of them, okay? First and foremost, let's go ahead and refute this concept of repenting of your sins in order to be saved using this passage of scripture. Now, look at verse number 20, if you would, because here's the thing, people, I mean, if you post something on social media that all you have to do is believe and trust uh, on the Lord to, uh, for salvation, they'll just put Acts 2.38. But folks, in order for us to understand the Bible, in order for us to understand what that even means, you, you need the entire chapter. And it frustrates me that people don't know what context means, okay? What is context? It means the text that's with the text. So we can't just pull out one verse out of the Bible and say, well, this is what it means. We're just ignore everything else. Now, here's the funny thing. Look at verse 20. They love Acts chapter two, verse 38, but they just don't like every other verse in the Bible in, the, uh, in this particular chapter, because look what it says in verse 20. The sun shall be, shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, that's interesting. It doesn't say anything about whosoever shall repent of their sins shall be saved. It literally says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, which is synonymous with what we see in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 13, to call upon the name of the Lord based upon your belief in Jesus Christ. So anytime someone brings up Acts 2.38, I take them to this verse, verse 21. But let's look at verse number 40. So this is the same group of people that he's speaking to. He says in verse 40, and with many other words that he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Look what it says in verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Now, hold on a second. Does it say now they that gladly repented of their sin? No, it says they that gladly received his word were baptized and the same day that were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now folks, if verse 38 meant that people had to turn from their sin in order to be saved, why does it say that in verse 41? Why does it say they, they gladly received this word? Because those who gladly received the word is synonymous with those who believe and place their faith in the word of God for salvation. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. He says in verse 42, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Look at verse 44. And all that repented of their sin were together. No, actually it says, and all that believed were together and had all things common. That's what the word of God says. So this concept that you have to repent of your sins using Acts 2.38 is completely flawed due to the fact that the verses prior to it and the verses after it clearly show and emphasize and support the doctrine that you have to believe in order to be saved. Go to Acts 19. Let's look at John the Baptist preaching about repentance because John the Baptist definitely preached about repentance. Jesus preached the same thing about repentance. Look at what John the Baptist preached about repentance. It says in Acts 19, 4, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of what? Repentance. Say, so what was he saying? What was he saying when he baptized with the baptism of repentance? Saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ. So what was the repentance he was preaching? That they needed to believe on Christ. Okay, now look if you would, you say, well, how does that work? Matthew 21, 32 explains it. Flip back to Matthew 21, 32. Matthew 21, 32, also dealing with John the Baptist preaching. Let's see how John the Baptist preaching of repentance fits in with believing on Jesus Christ, not with turning over a new leaf in this context. Matthew 21, 32, notice what the Bible says. For John, this is Jesus speaking about John. Remember, we allow the Bible to define itself. We don't say, here's what John was preaching. We let the Bible tell us what John was preaching. We let Jesus tell us what John was preaching. Notice what Jesus said, Matthew 21, 32. For John came unto you, this is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye, notice his word, believed. That's the message. That's the goal. 
and ye believed him not. He said, John came preaching. John came saying all those things, you know, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and ye believed him not. Now notice what Jesus says. But, but the publicans, those are the really bad sinners, and the harlots, those are the really bad sinners, believed him. He said, you religious people, you didn't believe him, but these really bad people, they believed him. Now notice, don't, don't miss this. Notice what he says. And he, when ye had seen it, repented not. He said, here's your problem. You didn't believe them. You should have repented. And the Pharisees would say, us repent? We're not the harlots. We're not the publicans. We're not the bad sinners. But notice what he says. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward. Notice what the repentance would have brought forth that ye might believe him. Amen. Here's what he's saying. You weren't believing. They did believe. You should have repented and turned or changed your mind from not believing to believing. You see, in Matthew 3, 2, you don't have to turn there, but John the Baptist preached saying, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Did he say, repent of your sins? No, he just said, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus preached the same thing in Matthew 4, 17. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But if we look at Mark 1, 15, he gives more detail about what was preached by Jesus in this case. It says in Mark 1, 15, saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and stop sinning. Is that what it says? No, it says repent ye and believe the gospel. Why do they need to repent? Because they didn't believe the gospel. They didn't believe John the Baptist. They didn't believe Jesus. They needed to repent and believe. Turn from their false doctrine and false religion and false belief and rejection and denial of Christ and repent to the acknowledging of the truth and repent and believe the gospel. It's that simple. And let's, let's just, just be honest as you look at this passage in Acts 17. Because often people will just out of context quote verse 30 where it says, you know, where he's preaching the gospel and he says, the times of this ignorant, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. They just add, he's commanding everyone to repent of their sins, which is not what he's saying. Let's get the context of what's being taught here. Go to verse 22. It says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. So here we have a people that is polytheistic. They worship a lot of different gods. And they have all these different altars to all these different gods that they worship. And you know, the Greek gods are, are you know, what? Athena, and you've probably heard of them, right? I don't really care to even remember them. You know, all these Greek and Roman gods that they worship. Well, they had all these different altars, different gods, and then just in case they missed one, they didn't want to make some god somewhere upset and, and make him feel left out. So they just built an altar that was just kind of a general purpose altar just to the unknown god. Like, okay, we got the god of, of water and the god of fire and the god of love and the god of hunting. And then just in case we missed one, Let's just do the unknown God, okay? And Paul's saying, man, you guys are too superstitious. I mean, not only you worship all these gods, but then you make one of the unknown God. He said, well, I'm going to preach to you about the unknown God. That's just kind of a, an icebreaker that he used to start preaching the gospel, just to, just to get their attention. And he explains that since God made the world and all things therein, he doesn't live in temples made with hay. He doesn't live in your little altar, your little temple to the unknown God. And then in verse 29, it says, For as much then as we're the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. He's pointing out their idols, their little statues of what they call gods. And he's saying, look, if God created the world, he's not an image that you can carve and, and a statue that you make and bow down to. That's not what the Godhead is like. And he says in verse 30, And the times of this ignorance... God winked at. What, what ignorance? The ignorance of thinking that a little piece of stone or a little metal statue is God. He says, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, 
because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, wherever he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he raised him from the dead. And of course, he preached the resurrection. And then verse 34, it says, certain men clave unto him and believed. Some of the people believed the message that Paul preached. But look, when he's telling them to repent here, what is he telling them to repent of? He says, look, you're worshiping idols, you're worshiping false gods, you think that this statue is God, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. He's telling them to repent or to turn from worshiping of false gods. He's saying, look, you're worshiping false gods, you need to worship the one true God, you need to repent and turn from false gods to the true God. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, you'll see the exact same thing. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Now look, when he said repent there, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent, was he talking about repenting of your sinful lifestyle? Was he telling them, you guys need to quit drinking and quit smoking and quit carousing and you need to quit fornicating and you need to quit stealing and you need to quit lying. You need to turn from all that in order to be saved. In order to be saved, you need to be willing to turn from drinking and smoking and partying and, and fornicating and stealing and lying and murder. Is that what he was telling them that they needed to turn from? No. But that's what's being preached today. People take Acts 17, 30, and they say, in order to be saved, you must be willing to turn from your sins. And they'll say to somebody who's a drunk that they have to repent of that in order to be saved. Or that they have to turn from whatever, whether it be uh, lying, stealing, whatever. And so what we see here is that what they had to turn from was idols, because that's not God. See, you can't just add God. Now, and and look, look at 1 Thessalonians 1, and then I'll explain it to you. Look at verse 9. It says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. And this is a similar group of people. The Thessalonians had a similar religion to those that we see in Acts 17. It says, And how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Now, could that be described as repentance there? That's repentance, right? I mean, they were worshiping idols, false gods. They turned to God from idols so that they could serve the living and true God. That was repentance. Did that repentance save them? Yeah, because it, it meant that they were not believing in their false God anymore. Now they're believing in the one true God. But was that repenting of all their sins? Willing to turn from a, a, a sinful lifestyle? No. Look at chapter 20. It says in verse... Uh, Verse 20, it says, How I have kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So here we're talking about turning to God, right? And we're talking about turning toward the Lord Jesus Christ with faith, right? Believing on Christ. Anything about repenting of sins in this verse? Now go, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, because it's interesting. In Acts 20, 21, we see repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a similar wording that's found in Hebrews 6, verse 1. It says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of, watch this, repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Now look, when we repent toward God, here in Hebrews 6, 1, the Bible talks about us repenting from dead works. You say, well, what does that mean, dead works? Well, think about this. Faith without works is dead, right? So if you have faith without works, that's dead faith, right? So what if you have, what if you have works without faith? That's dead works. See what I mean? So faith without works is dead faith, and works without faith is dead works. Look, works that you're doing, where you think you're serving God, but you have not believed on Jesus Christ, are dead works. Look at Acts 3.19. Let's look at another portion of scripture here with the term repent in it. Acts 3.19 says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send, he shall send Jesus Christ, which is, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitutions of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Now again, repent ye therefore and be converted. 
no mention of sins here. Of course, he's preaching this, and this actually, this message actually carries on to chapter number four. Look at chapter four and verse number one. So in order to understand what he's actually talking about when he says, repent ye therefore and be converted, we actually have to finish the sermon. Look at verse one of, of Acts chapter four. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit, many of them which heard the word repented of their sins, believed. And the number of the men was about 5,000. So here's the thing. I know people want to stick to chapter three in order to that particular phrase, repent and be converted. But you know what I like to do? I just like to read the entire Bible. I just like to just listen to the entire sermon. I just like to go to the next chapter. And by the way, the chapters were added later on, folks. The breaks in the, 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 the books here were added on later, late, later on to help us with referencing and memorization. And so you can't just take Acts chapter 3 and say, well, we just need to isolate this particular part. No, he's not even done with the sermon yet. So let's find out what the response is. And it's funny that after this, Peter didn't say, hey, what are you guys doing? Are you guys are supposed to be repenting of your sin. Why are you just believing? Believing? Just believing doesn't get you saved. Don't you know the devils believe? The devils believe and tremble. Is that what he's saying? No. In fact, God actually confirms this and says that the number of the men was about 5,000. Looking at these verses in context then, a fair assessment of various verses where repentance is connected to salvation seem to be tipping the balance in favor of believing in Christ as the only requirement for eternal life, this being the definition of repentance itself, rather than a separate step added onto the repentance step. One of the arguments used to support this is that John's Gospel never mentions repentance once. A counter-argument to this is that other Gospels do tell us to repent, and John who wrote this Gospel also wrote Revelation, which does mention repentance repeatedly. Does this counter-argument carry any weight? Now look, isn't salvation the most important thing? Yes. I mean, what's a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I mean, the number one most important doctrine is salvation. Now, let me ask you something. Is God trying to hide salvation from us? No, no sir. No, he wrote the book of John that we might believe on Christ and that believing we might have life through his name. Look, if repenting of your sins was something that we had to do to be saved, wouldn't God tell us that? So why do all these preachers say you have to repent of your sins to be saved when the term repent of your sins is never found in the Bible once? I mean, isn't that a fair question? If the Bible never one time says repent of sin, and that's something that we have to do to be saved, good night! Why didn't he warn us? Why didn't he tell us? But look, I have hundreds of verses that say believe. Why? Because believing is what you have to do to be saved. See, the book of John is the only book in the Bible that claims to be a book written to get somebody saved. See, most of the Bible is written to people that are already saved. You know, you look at a book like Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians, those are written to the saints. It says it right at the beginning of the book. Written to the churches of Galatia. The book of Romans is written to the saved. It says it's to the saints which are in Christ Jesus. Is Romans written to the unsaved? No. no. It says it's written to the saints which are in Christ Jesus. But you know what? The only book in the Bible that claims to be written unto the unsaved to get them saved is the book of John. And at the end of the book of John, he says, these things are written that you might believe on the Son of God. And I'm paraphrasing, but he said, and that believing you might have life through his name. He claims that that's why the book is written. Okay, that's why the Bible in the book of John says believe in almost every chapter. Because yep. if it's a book about getting somebody saved, it's going to talk a lot about believing. That's why in John, right away in John 1, 12, he says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That sounds like a great book for getting somebody saved. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 15 says the same thing. John 3, 36 says, he that believeth on the son hath everlasting life. 
uh, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You know, right away, John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say to thee, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. John chapter 6 repeatedly says that you have to believe to have eternal life. Several times in that verse 40, I think, verse 41, I know for sure, verse 47. You get into chapter 7, he says, Whosoever believeth. You get into chapter 9, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? You get into chapter 10, it's believe. You get into chapter 11, it's I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And the book of John says, Believe, 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 believe. And it says this book is written that you might believe and be saved and have eternal life. It's written to the unsaved to get them saved. How many times is the word repent found in the book of John? Zero. Not even once. So if that's the big important thing, why is it never even mentioned one time? Say, wow, well, that's dumb because it's mentioned in these other books. Look, if it were, if it's not written in the book of John, then John is not an adequate book to save you if you have to do that to be saved. Right? I mean, if, I have the, if all I have is the book of John and says, well, this book says it's written so that people will get saved, I can't even show the whole gospel from John as far as what you have to do to be saved? That doesn't make any sense. False doctrine never makes sense. You know what makes sense to me? It makes sense to me that I'm a sinner, that I deserve hell, and that I'm unworthy of being saved no matter how much I clean up my life. Because all my righteousnesses to God are as filthy rags. That makes sense. And it makes sense that Jesus died for all my sins and paid my punishment for me. And all I have to do is just turn to him and just believe on him and be saved. That makes sense. But you know what doesn't make sense? Telling me that I have to turn from all my sins to be saved and then turning around and telling me, oh, by the way, it's a free gift that Jesus did everything. It's like, what did Jesus do every Jesus did everything, but you got to make some serious change in your life. Well, did Jesus do everything or not? Is it free or not? Is it a gift or not? Is it faith alone or not? It's funny, we're taught we were out soul winning the other day, and 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 we asked somebody what they have to do to be saved. They said, believe on Christ. And they said, they said, Yeah, I don't know why people make the gospel so complicated. It's just so simple. It's just so Jesus did everything. We just believe on Jesus. It's so simple. And I'm thinking, like, yeah, it is simple. And then that same person, I asked that person if you could lose your salvation. Oh yeah, you can lose your salvation. I mean, you can't just live however you want. And you know, you do have to repent of all your sins. And you know, if you don't live right, if you don't go to church, you're like, what? You just, so, I say, now you're making it complicated. Don't be turned from the simplicity in Christ, that's in Christ to another gospel, another Jesus, another uh, 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 salvation that's not biblical. Even if the Bible never says, verbatim, repent of sins, what about the verses where turning from sin is the context of repentance? As stated earlier, the repent of your sins messages are not without ammunition. This issue must be addressed. The closest thing that I've found is in Acts chapter 8, when the term, repent therefore of this thy wickedness is found, and it's talking to somebody who's already saved. Go to Acts chapter 8, if you would, Acts chapter number 8. Look at verse number 22. This is referring to Simon. Simon was a sorcerer, and he gets saved, and then he starts seeing the apostles performing these miracles, and he wants to do it as well, but obviously not for righteous reasons. And he expresses this, and then look at verse 22. Repent therefore this of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Now, here in this particular verse, in verse 22, he's not, Peter's not telling Simon, hey, you need to get saved again. You lost your salvation, you got to repent of your sins. This is after he's been saved. Okay. He says in verse 23, For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Look at verse 24. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Now, what is he referring to? He's referring to the gall of bitterness. He's referring to the bond of iniquity. He's like, pray the Lord that I don't become bitter because of this. That I don't get enwrapped in, in, in 
in the bond of iniquity. You say, well, how do you know that this is not referring to salvation? Well, look at verse number nine, if you would, verse nine. But there are certain men, there's a certain man called Simon, which before time in the city was a used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon also, excuse me, then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So prior to that whole event taking place, what do we see him doing? Believing and then being baptized because that's what Matthew 28 tells people to do. Okay. So thereafter, when he says, repent of this thy wickedness, this is just referring to his Christian life now. And, and, and you know what Simon says? He says, man, I want you to pray for me that none of these things happen to me. He said he's sorry. I mean, right away, he, he completely repents of it and, and realizes I've been an idiot. I shouldn't have offered you money for that. I was wrong. So we see that he has a good heart. And look, he's not trying to buy something from them that's bad. I mean, the power of the Holy Spirit's a good thing. He wanted something good. He was just going about getting it in the wrong way by trying to get it through money. Was he ignorant? Yes. Was it stupid? Yes. Was it sin? Yes. But was he just this bad person who was it? No, he made a mistake. And as soon as he was corrected, he responded properly to that correction by humbling himself and admitting that he had done wrong. That's great. That's the closest thing you're gonna find in the whole Bible to repent of your sins. That had nothing to do with salvation. It's a guy who's already saved, who made a dumb decision. If you were to say to somebody that the Bible never says repent of your sins to be saved, and that repentance means to change your mind, which doesn't necessarily mean uh, sin in all cases. They might take you to the book of Revelation, which uses the word repent frequently and in the context of sin as well. Uh, now, the first mention of uh, repentance in Revelation is uh, 2.5, when Jesus is speaking to the angel of the church of Ephesus, but the context is not turning from sin. In verse 2 and 3, Jesus praises the uh, work of the church, saying, I, I know your works and your labour and your patience and so on speaking positively about the church, but then in verse 4, he has to explain that he uh, has one matter against the church because they have left their uh, first love, and so on. And in verse 5, he tells them to repent and do the first works. Now, it's not clear from the chapter itself what those first works are are exactly. Uh, some people interpret it as preaching the gospel, others interpret it as, uh, you know, loving your brethren or, or whatever it might be. But but this isn't about repenting of your sins, that there's no specific sin being addressed exactly, if we don't know what the first works is. It's a call to get back to the first works, which is, is different from the works that they are already being praised for by Jesus. And uh, it's addressed to a church, okay, this, this is not telling unbelievers how to be saved you know it's got nothing to do with salvation the next mention uh, is, is later in chapter 2 addressing the angel of the church of Pergamos once again in verse 13 Jesus praises their works and he praises their faith so again this is not about getting people saved otherwise why is Jesus praising their faith Jesus very specifically says about this church they have not denied my faith but the problem in that church is in verse 14 uh, that they are tolerating some people among the congregation that hold to the doctrine of Balaam. Those specific people hold to the doctrine of uh, eating things sacrificed unto idols and committing fornication. And so in verse 15, Jesus is not telling those people uh, who hold to the doctrine of Balaam to, to turn from their idolatry and fornication. He's actually telling the remainder of the church to, to repent of associating with those people of Balaam. So the repentance is something very specific and it's addressed to what is otherwise a faithful church. It's not telling unsaved sinners to turn from the alcohol or turn from the pornography or, you know, put the cigarettes down to obtain eternal life. That's just, that's not being spoken about here. Now, the closest thing to repent of your sins in Revelation is when Jesus addresses the angel of the church of Thyatira. So once again, he, he's praising the church's works 
okay, in verse 19, but he has a specific matter against the uh, church for tolerating this woman Jezebel. Uh, to teach to seduce my servants, Jesus says, um, to, to do the same, and essentially doing the same doctrines that he warned about those with Balaam and to the previous church. Again, things sacrificed onto idols and fornication. So just like the church of Pergamos, the church of Thyatira is permitting and tolerating this false prophet teaching these wicked deeds. Now Jesus gave uh, Jezebel space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. And notice it doesn't say she repented of all of her sins for salvation. It's repentance of a very particular wickedness, just like in Acts chapter eight, Simon was told to repent of a very specific wickedness, not turn from all of his sins to be saved. And then in Revelation three, Jesus is still addressing churches, so not unsafe sinners and he tells the church of Sardis to repent of not being watchful and forgetting what they have received and heard whether that be truth doctrine the gospel or, or whatever it was he then tells the church of Laodicea to repent for being lukewarm now a lot of people misinterpret that passage about lukewarm sort of idle slothful Christians not being saved but the thing is it's not addressed to a single Christian it's addressed to a church there are lukewarm churches there are not lukewarm individuals so th th again this is not about an unsaved sinner getting saved once again in Revelation and so we see a pattern when the Bible says turn from wickedness or turn from iniquity it's addressed to believers that that's why it says uh, 2 Timothy 2.19 it says let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from his iniquity it doesn't tell the publicans and harlots to depart from their iniquity it's those that name the name of Christ 2 Chronicles 7 the Lord uh, replies to Solomon's prayer if my people not, not the wicked, sinful Gentiles and the pagans from these other nations. It's if my people, who were called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then God will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land, be attentive to their prayer, and his heart shall be there perpetually, and so on and so on. And in Solomon's prayer in the uh, previous chapter, Solomon said, if they, referring to, to God's people, not, not the outside nations, if God's people sin against thee. So he says, if they sin against thee, but then he goes on to say in brackets, for there is no man which sins not. So according to Solomon's prayer, even among God's own people, there is no man which does not sin. So repenting for your sins for salvation then, doesn't work otherwise why is he even praying that prayer that wouldn't really make any sense now later on in revelation when we see repentance or rather lack thereof uh, in uh, chapter 9 and chapter 16 this is when god is uh, releasing the plagues of wrath onto the world and, and it's in the in this context people being subject to the wrath of god who will not repent of uh, the works of their hands or worshipping devils, idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, etc. Won't repent of their murders, their sorceries, their fornication and, and theft. And they repented not to give glory. But most Christians would probably agree that this wrath is, of God is not going to be poured out on believers. And if you have a pre-millennial view, believers are already going to be raptured out of, of the world before these plagues of wrath are poured out on the wicked world much of the remaining world people that are left behind well a lot of them have already bowed down to worship the beast they've already got the mark in the right hand or in the forehead so there's probably no prospect of them even getting saved once again this is this is not giving an instruction to unsaved people to tell them how to repent and believe it's just simply documenting the wicked world that's given over to the beast that's not been raptured out of there that's been subject to the wrath of god but they won't repent of their deeds it's got nothing to do with salvation there are a handful of um, other scriptures uh, in the gospels where jesus points to uh, repentance of cities such as nineveh or addresses untimely deaths of sinners such as the, the galileans uh, who Pilate mingled sacrifices with their blood or the 18 killed by the tower of silo and he uses uh, that to sorry jesus uses that to point to repentance that the various jews and pharisees should have done when they saw Jesus. In other words, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. But what you have to understand is that the repentance of those cities is a, is a pattern of repentance, if you like, a physical illustration of the spiritual repentance that is required of us. When the city of Sodom was destroyed for being unrepentant, it, it was destroyed because of its sin, not because of its lack of faith. But its destruction was final. It, it happened once and that was the end of it. 
But but everlasting judgment though, that, that does not come to an end. That's forever, that's everlasting judgment. So you, so you can only apply the destruction of a city allegorically to repentance for salvation, not really literally. In the New Testament, Jesus did his mighty works. The goal was that people would see those works and then should believe on him. But as we know from the uh, Synoptic Gospels, uh, there were many um, unrepentant sin uh, cities that did not receive him. And in John's Gospel, it was revealed that uh, various Jews and Pharisees saw these works and couldn't refute those works. They couldn't even argue against those works, but they still didn't believe him, though. And, and they were without excuse, really. And so, because they will not repent of their unbelief, they will perish for all eternity, just as the cities in the Old Testament that did not repent of their wickedness perished in an earthly destruction. And when you look at the repentance of Nineveh being a prime example of a city that, that did repent, the, o the only thing that we really know about this story is that they repented of their wickedness and consequently God did not destroy the city. That, that doesn't mean with any certainty that every single person in the city, down to every last man, woman and child, all got saved onto eternal life. That, you know, they're, they're not, we don't know that they're all in heaven right now because salvation is applied to individuals, not an entire city. And even if you were to assert that everybody in Nineveh got saved, quote unquote, well, just read chapter three and, and see which comes first, okay? It says they believed God in verse five and their turning from wickedness and appealing to God came into the verses after that. Okay, so the belief came first and the repentance of sins came second. That's the correct biblical order of things. But we're being told by all these evangelists like Ray Comfort and Franklin Graham, just like his father Billy Graham, first you have to repent of your sins, then you have to believe in Jesus. And they probably point to Mark 1.15 where it says first repent and then it says believe. But we quite, we quite clearly see here that belief came before the turning from sins. So this repent of your sins to be saved doctrine, it, it's not adding up. And if, if we as Christians believe concerning the gospel that, that men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost and God in his foreknowledge knew that Christians would be arguing over this definition of repentance well it's no accident that Jesus doing the will of the Father was compelled to phrase Luke 5:32 in a very specific way he didn't say I came to urge sinners to repent of their sins you know applying to us in the verb form what he actually said is I, Jesus, came to call, so call is the action, the verb, if you like. Jesus is doing the calling. This is, this is not an action word we are supposed to do. Jesus is doing the action. Jesus is doing the calling. Jesus is doing the, the work here, quote unquote. And Jesus is causing the turning here. And he says, I came to call sinners, in its noun form, to repentance. Again, in the noun form. So it's not, I came to call sinners to repent of their sins. It's, I came to call sinners to to repentance in the noun form. So if we look very carefully at the language that Jesus uses, he's not telling sinners to do an action, repent of your sins, to, to achieve the result. He's calling sinners, so he's doing the calling, and he's calling sinners onto a state of, or, or the position of repentance. And that is manifest in those who believe on him for salvation versus those who don't. It's Jonah 3.10, go ahead and turn to Jonah 3.10. You say, why is this so important? You know, Jonah 3.10 pretty much sums it up here. It says in Jonah 3.10, and God saw their works. What did God see? Works. works. God saw their works, comma, and now he's going to tell us what those works were. That they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. That right there says that when you turn from your evil way, that's your works. So if you believe that a person has to turn from their evil way and believe on Christ. Here's what you're saying. They have to believe on Christ and have works. And you know what? The Bible says salvation is without works. And Jonah 3.10 says turning from your sins or turning from your evil way is works. So that's why this is such an important doctrine. You see, the devil wants to get you to trust your works to save you. If the Bible never says to repent of your sins to be saved and repeatedly says to believe on him, the question remains, where is this terminology coming from? Earlier in this documentary, we showed you many clips of Christians repeating this phrase as they define repentance as turning from sins or completely surrendering yourself to Jesus. 
But we also showed clips of non-Christians defining repentance in this way, some of them simply replacing the name of Jesus with another name. Looking at their religious books, it is easy to see where this strict definition and terminology is coming from, the spirit that is behind it, and the knock-on effect this has on modern translations of the Bible. So I've searched the Bible and I've tried to find repent of your sins, but here's what's interesting. I did a, I did a search on the Book of Mormon. Now who here agrees that the Book of Mormon is written by Satan? All right, pretty much the whole room. Okay, so you know, basically I did a search on the Book of Mormon. Because, I mean, I searched the Bible, repent of your sins, repent of sin, it just isn't there. Yet preachers are constantly saying it. I searched the Book of Mormon and it just keeps coming up. The, the Book of Mormon uses the phrase repent of sins frequently. Probably about 40 times, give or take, a handful where, where the phrase or a very similar phrase is used. Notwithstanding the hundreds of mentions of the word repentance in the Book of Mormon where sin is the context, even if the phrase is not used. Yep. Here's some verses from the Book of Mormon. Jacob 3.8. Listen to this. O oh, my brethren, I fear that unless you shall repent of your sins, that their skins will be whiter than yours, when ye shall be brought with them before the throne of God. In but Mosiah 16.13, it says, And now ought ye not to tremble and repent of your sins? 3 Nephi 12, 19. You shall believe me and shall repent of your sins and come unto me with a broken heart and contrite spirit. 3 Nephi 9, 13. Repent of your sins and be converted that I may heal you. Mosiah 4, 10. And again, believe that you must repent of your sins and forsake them and humble yourself before God and ask in sincerity of heart that he forgive you and blah, blah, blah. Look, I don't even have time to go through them all, friend. Because the Book of Mormon tells you over and over again to repent of your sins. Why didn't the Bible teach us that? The conflation of repentance required for salvation and the turning from sins of believers is nothing new. It has been around for a long time. Mormonism was not the first religion or denomination to conflate these two things. Early Catholic theologians and early church fathers were already conflating these two things in their writings. The phrase, repent of sins, can be traced back to some of these writings, although the lingo was not used so excessively and repetitively as it is today. Latin Bibles replaced the word repent with do penance, so this became more commonly used lingo in place of repent of sins. On Repentance, Chapter 5, written by Tertullian. Thus he, who through repentance for sins, had begun to make satisfaction to the Lord, will through another repentance of his repentance make satisfaction to the devil, and will be the more hateful to God in proportion as he will be the more acceptable to his rival. This was one of the simpler passages to read from this writing, as Tertullian uses very dressed up language about repentance, which makes the whole book for the average reader very difficult to understand. 1 Clement chapter 7 verse 7 Jonah preached destruction unto the men of Nineveh, but they, repenting of their sins, obtained pardon of God by their supplications and received salvation, albeit they were aliens from God. Arguably, the writer could just be referring to physical salvation in this context, given how the verse ends. 2 Clement 8, 2-4 For in like manner as the potter, if he be making a vessel, and it get twisted or crushed in his hands, reshapeth it again, but if he have once put it into the fiery oven, he shall no longer mend it. So also let us, while we are in this world, repent with our whole heart of the evil things which we have done in the flesh, that we may be saved by the Lord, while we yet have time for repentance. For after that we have departed out of the world, we can no more make confession there, or repent any more. Wherefore, brethren, if we shall have done the will of the Father, and kept the flesh pure, and guarded the commandments of the Lord, we shall receive life eternal. Notice the lack of what Jesus did in this equation. 2 Clement 16.4 Almsgiving, therefore, is a good thing, even as repentance from sin. Fasting is better than prayer, but almsgiving better than both, and love covereth a multitude of sins, but prayer out of a good conscience delivereth from death. Blessed is every man that is found full of these, for almsgiving lifteth off the burden of sin. 
the Latin-speaking half of the Catholic and Orthodox Church heavily influenced hardcore works-based salvation. And uh, this can be seen in the Latin Bible. Instead of translating repent as recipicite, they translated it as ponitentium agite, pardon my pronunciation. So if you read the Douay Reims Catholic translation in English, Matthew 4.17, for example, instead of saying repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, it says do penance for the kingdom of God is at hand. So they changed that word there. So instead of repentance being a simple word that means to change your mind or change direction or be sorrowful, it's become this sensational word of falling onto your knees and absolute tears of all of your past deeds and an absolute hatred for the sin and all of your soul is gushing out like vomit out of your soul. And all of this self-reformation and self-correction stuff and, and working hard not to do those same things again next time. It's, and it's become a sacrament rather than just a simple verb which can mean different things in, in different parts of the Bible. So the Catholics essentially rewrote the Bible to, to squeeze this definition into it. And so this act of doing penance is what, what we would read from the pulpit and, and be read by any reader of a Catholic Bible back in the day. Luke chapter 13 verse 3. The Catholic Bible has changed this to say, No, I say unto you, but unless you shall do penance, you shall all likewise perish. Mark 6.12. Again, the Catholic Bible has changed what this verse says. It says, and going forth they preached that men should do penance. Matthew 3, 2, and saying, do penance, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You can also find, in Eastern Orthodoxy, the conflation of repentance for salvation with turning from sin, although the use of the phrase, repent of your sins, is still not excessively used, necessarily. This is a quote from Gregory Palamas. All our life is a season of repentance. For God desires not the flesh of the sinner, as it is written, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Approaching the time of the Reformation, Protestant reformers often talked about repentance. Like some early Christian writers, such as Tertullian, they often wrote long, poetic, fanciful speeches on the subject, rather than using direct, to the point language. The phrase repent of sins was not yet becoming repetitive lingo, it would only appear occasionally but the association of repentance with self-reformation was still apparent and would continue to be so after the Reformation before the phrase was popularised. A quote by John Calvin from the Institute of Christian Religion, Volume 3. Again, a Redeemer will come to Zion and to those in Jacob who repent of their sins. Calvin is paraphrasing Isaiah 59.20. This is not a direct quote. A quote from Martin Luther found in the sermon Christ delivered to his disciples. Repentance rather signifies here a change and reformation of the whole life, so that when one knows that he is a sinner and feels the iniquity of his life, he desists from it and enters upon a better course of life, in word and deed, and that he does it from his heart. A quote from John Wesley in Sermon 14, The Repentance of Believers. Repentance frequently means an inward change, a change of mind from sin to holiness but we now speak of it in quite a different sense, as it is one kind of self-knowledge, the knowing ourselves sinners, yea, guilty, helpless sinners, even though we know we are children of God. By the time we get to the 19th century, the Book of Mormon was released, which uses this phrase repetitively. Outside of Mormonism, other heterodox groups arose, such as Seventh-day Adventism and the Bible student movement, now the Jehovah's Witnesses, and this phrase was occasionally used. Um, Ellen G. White, who influenced Adventism, also used the phrase repentance from sin a handful of times in her writings. Quotes from Ellen G. White, found in Steps to Christ, Chapter 3. Repentance includes sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. We shall not renounce sin unless we see its sinfulness. Until we turn away from it in heart, there will be no real change in the life. The sinner may resist this love, may refuse to be drawn to Christ, but if he does not resist, he will be drawn to Jesus. A knowledge of the plan of salvation will lead him to the foot of the cross in repentance for his sins, which have caused the sufferings of God's dear Son. Beware of procrastination. Do not put off the work of forsaking your sins and seeking purity of heart through Jesus. Here is where thousands upon thousands have erred to their eternal loss. But there was no genuine repentance for sin 
no conversion of purpose, no abhorrence of evil. Charles Taze Russell, in his book Millennial Dawn, he obviously influenced the Jehovah's Witnesses, and he did once use the repa- phrase repentance from sin once in, in that book. Charles Taze Russell, in the Millennial Dawn. Let no one hastily suppose that there is in this view anything in conflict with the teaching of the Scriptures, that faith towards God, repentance for sin, and reformation of character are indispensable to salvation. This feature will be treated more at length hereafter, but we now suggest that only the few that have ever had a sufficiency of light to produce full faith, repentance, and reformation. Among Protestantism, this phrase would be in its infancy, as Charles Spurgeon started to use it occasionally, and tied repentance very heavily with the transformation of one's life. A quote from Charles Spurgeon in The Repentance Unto Life. Yet again, I must ask you one question more. Do you think you'll repent of your sins if no punishment were placed before you? Or do you repent because you know you shall be punished forever if you remain in your sins? Somehow this phrase, repent of your sins, was a phrase that was only occasionally used, but since the 19th century has spread like wildfire and become everyday Christian lingo in just about every denomination of Christianity and every persuasion of gospel messages. So, you can see the phrase starting to creep its way in in the 19th century. It's just that the actual concept is nothing new. But but somewhere along the lines, it, it's crept its way into mainstream branches of Christianity. So, evangelicals are saying it, Protestants are saying it, Catholics are saying it, Orthodox are saying it. Now, it's difficult to know with certainty how that happened. The easiest person, if we were to point fingers at somebody for popularising this phrase, probably the easiest person to point the finger at is Billy Graham being one of the most uh, famous evangelists of, of modern times who, who repeatedly use this phrase, all the meanwhile technologies such as television broadcasting emerged, and so his catchphrase is becoming very commonly used Christian language now. It, it was one of his personal sayings, and it's become Christian language. Repent of your sins to be saved. There are several avenues where Billy Graham could have picked up this catchphrase. Perhaps he read works such as Charles Spurgeon's writings, and although Spurgeon only used this phrase occasionally, perhaps Billy thought to use it far more frequently, believing that the catchphrase was more helpful for him to present his gospel message. Some people speculate whether Billy Graham was a member of the Freemasons. He certainly associated with many people in high offices who were Masons, and Mormonism has very strong links with Freemasonry, such as their secret handshakes and architectural designs of their temples. It is possible, although not proven, that Billy Graham may have indirectly picked up this lingo from the Book of Mormon via the Freemasons. Or perhaps the truth is far less complicated. He simply heard it from other pastors and teachers that influenced him in his early life. But even though this phraseology is spread like wildfire in Christianity, defining repentance as as turning from sin, and self-reforming as a necessary component of the gospel, however you would define salvation. It's nothing new, though. It's a fundamental part of non-Christian religion or heterodox Christian religion. It's a fundamental part of works-based salvation models in Christianity and Judaism before it. By defining repentance as turning from sins, just as the Roman Catholic Church rewrote the Bible by replacing the word with penance, Protestants and evangelicals and smaller heterodox groups have also rewritten Bibles to impress this self-correction and self-reformation definition of repentance on the reader. In the King James Bible, in Acts chapter 26 verse 20, Paul recalled how he preached to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. In this rendering, there is a clear distinction between the repentance itself, the turning to God, and doing works to complement one's repentance. In the New International Version, they have rephrased this so as to say, repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. Contemporary dynamic equivalent Bibles often have similar readings, such as the Amplified Version, Contemporary English Version, and the Good News Translation. This verse isn't flat out promoting work salvation, but it's getting very close by insisting that the repentance isn't genuine if it doesn't produce works. In the New World Translation, produced by the Jehovah's Witnesses to support their heterodox beliefs, they have rephrased this verse to say, repent and turn to God by doing works that befit repentance. 
This translation has completely crossed the spectrum to flat out say that the works themselves are the repentance, not something that ought to complement repentance. In the Clear Word translation, which is a paraphrase written by a Seventh-day Adventist to promote their heterodox beliefs, this too makes the works the repentance itself by rephrasing this verse to say, change their ways, to repent of their sins, and to live for God. The New Living Translation is more widely accepted in Evangelical Christianity, and is not so widely dismissed as a heretical translation. Yet even the translators of this Bible rephrased the verse to say, repent of their sins and turn to God, and prove they have changed by the good things they do. The Passion Translation is alleged to have been written specifically so as to prop up new apostolic reformation and hypercharismatic doctrines, and changes Matthew 3 too, so that instead of saying, repent you for the kingdom of God is at hand, it instead says, you'd better keep turning away from evil and turn back to God. This translation has been endorsed by Bill Johnson, a leading figure in the new apostolic reformation. Now, what's interesting is that these modern Bible versions, the NIV and the New King James, for example, they make a lot of changes to the Bible. They corrupt scripture. And one of the changes that they make is that they remove the word repent from 46 verses. Okay, there are 105 times in the King James Bible, or 105 verses that is, that use the word repentance. Well, 46 of those are removed from all the modern versions. But here's what's funny about it. You know which ones they remove? They don't just randomly remove 46 of them. Oh no, they specifically and purposely remove every time God repented, they remove it. That's what they take out. And then they take out other things that are problematic to them. Like, for example, the verse I just read for you from Exodus 13, 17, they remove repent from that verse. And, you know, they remove Judas Iscariot repenting. You see, they remove anything that can prove that repenting does not mean repenting of your sins. Yep. Yep. That's right. All the ones that just make it so obvious that repent does not mean repent of your sins, that's what they specifically purposely remove. There's an agenda behind it. I'm telling you, the devil is out there to promote this doctrine that in order to be saved, you must repent of your sins because it's work salvation. What about religions outside of Christianity? Is their concept of repentance really so different than what most Christians believe? The Quran, as far as I know, rather like the Bible, doesn't tend to use the phrase repent of your sins. But repentance in the Qur'an is often strongly tied with self-reformation, self-correction, the works of a Muslim believer based on the surrounding context of the verse that says repent. Rather like Catholicism, Islam is heavily a works-based religion. The ongoing repentance of sins is a necessary requirement to enter into heaven, paradise and escape hell. 7 Surah Al-Araf verse 153 but those who committed misdeeds and then repented after them and believed, indeed your Lord thereafter is forgiving and merciful. 25 Surah al furqan verses 70 to 71. Except for those who repent, believe and do righteous work, for them Allah will replace their evil deeds with good, and ever is Allah forgiving and merciful, and he who repents and does righteousness does indeed turn to Allah with accepted repentance. 6 Surah Al-Anam, verse 54 And when those come to you who believe in our verses, say, Peace be upon you, your Lord has decreed upon himself mercy. Let any of you who does wrong, out of ignorance, and then repents after that, and corrects himself. Indeed, he is forgiving and merciful. 4 Surah and Nisa, verses 16 to 18 And the two who commit it among you dishonour them both. But if they repent and correct themselves, leave them alone. Indeed, Allah is ever accepting of repentance and merciful. The repentance accepted by Allah is only for those who do wrong in ignorance or carelessness and then repent soon after. It is those to whom Allah will turn in forgiveness and Allah is ever knowing and wise, but repentance is not accepted of those who continue to do evil deeds up until when death comes to one of them he says, Indeed, I have repented now, or of those who die while they are disbelievers, for then we have prepared a painful punishment. 5 Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 39 But whoever repents after his wrongdoing and reforms, indeed, Allah will turn to him in forgiveness. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. 
In Hinduism, they have this doctrine of, and I might be pronouncing this wrong, but prayashita. It's a Sanskrit word which means atonement and penance, very similar to what we see in Catholicism. But it demands a list of actions and rituals that must accompany that repentance, trying to rebalance karma by adding good works to outweigh the, the misdeeds. And in fact, the word karma means works, and because Hinduism has this concept, this is obviously then carried forward into Buddhism, Sikhism and, and Jainism as well. Bhagavad Gita, 1866, a Hindu scripture. Abandon all the different types and classifications of righteousness. Simply surrender unto me, and you shall be liberated from all sinful consequences. Have no fear. Even the vilest sinners can worship me with exclusive devotion and become righteous because they have made the proper resolve. Manos Mariti, 11227, a Hindu scripture. By confession, by repentance, by austerity, by studying scriptural reading, and by charity, a sinner is freed from attachment to his sin, and thus the hard times that may result from the sin is also eased. Manos Mariti 11229 If one's heart is increasingly remorseful against one's misdeeds, then one will be increasingly purified of that misdeed. By cleaning our mind, we read the effect of sins on ourselves. Manos Mariti 11230 by repenting within, one rids of the inner impression of sin in the future. And when the person resolves to not commit the mistake again, then he becomes pure again. Either intentionally or unintentionally, if one has done a reprehensible act, he must not do it a second time, if he seeks absolution from the former. Filial Piety Sutra, a Buddhist scripture. The Buddha replied, Disciples of the Buddha, if you wish to repay your parents' kindness, write out this sutra on their behalf. Recite this sutra on their behalf. Repent of transgressions and offences on their behalf. For the sake of your parents, make offerings to the triple gem. For the sake of your parents, hold the precept of pure eating. For the sake of your parents, practice giving and cultivate blessings. If you are able to do these things, you are being a filial child. If you do not do these things, you are a person destined for the hells. Sutra in 42 sections, a Buddhist reading. Section 5. Reducing the Severity of Offences The Buddha said, if a person has many offences and does not repent of them, but cuts off all thought of repentance, the offences will engulf him. Just as water, returning to the sea, will gradually become deeper and wider, if a person has offences and realising they are wrong, reforms and does good, the offences will dissolve by themselves. Just as a sick person, who begins to perspire, will gradually be cured. Five-part Vinaya, a Buddhist scripture. In the practice of my Dharma, recognition of transgressions and repentance of them will lead to an increase in goodness. Nyamsara chapter 5, verses 82 to 83, a Jan scripture. By practicing self-analysis, a soul becomes equanimous and thus gains right conduct. In order to fortify this conduct, I shall speak of repentance, etc. He who, leaving aside all forms of speech, and getting rid of impure thoughts, activities, such as attachment, etc., meditates upon his own soul, is said from the real point of view, to have repentance. Verses 84-86 to 86. He, who avoiding all sorts of transgressions particularly, is absorbed in self-contemplation, is said to have repentance, because he himself is the embodiment of repentance. He, who avoiding all sorts of disinclination towards conduct, is absorbed in self-conduct, is said to have repentance, because he himself is the embodiment of repentance. He, who avoiding the wrong path, firmly walks in the right path, of the conquerors, is said to have repentance, because he himself is the embodiment of repentance. Siri Guru Granth Sahib, a Sikhi scripture. At the last moment, you repent, you are so blind. When the messenger of death seizes you and carries you away, you kept all things for yourself, but in an instant, they are all lost. Your intellect left you, your wisdom departed, and now you repent for the evil deeds you committed. Says Nanak, O mortal, in the third watch of the night, let your consciousness be lovingly focused on God. Without the true Guru, they are deluded by doubt, going to the world hereafter. What face will they display? What face will they show when they go there? They will regret and repent for their sins. Their actions will bring them only pain and suffering. Those who are imbued with the Nam are dyed in the deep crimson colour of the Lord's love. 
they merge into the being of their husband lord. The righteous judge of Dharma strikes them over the heads with his staff, and when the fruits of their actions come into their hands, then they regret and repent. Save me, save me, Lord. I am your humble servant, a mere worm. I seek the protection of your sanctuary, O primal Lord, cherisher and nourisher. So we start to see where the repent of your sins gospel comes from. It comes from false religion. It comes from false holy books. It comes from changing the real holy book. It comes from work salvation. That's where it comes from. And it's no accident that the Holy Ghost was very particular in the words that he moved the speakers and writers in the Bible to speak. Uh, one good example would be Acts chapter 2. It doesn't say, repent of your sins. It says, repent for the remission of sins. And a handful of other verses in the Bible also use that phrase, repentance for the remission of sins. You see, salvation and forgiveness of God is not based on the repentance of sin, it's based on the remission of sin. Because even if you turn from all of your sin, well, that, that doesn't get rid of the fact that you sinned. That's got nothing to do with Jesus, that's just you stopping sinning. Now, I don't think it's an accident that so-called Bible-believing churches across the world are preaching this junk. It's not an accident. Now, where did it come from? So, obviously, obviously, repenting of your sins of salvation has always been a part of false religions, isn't it, everywhere? And we, we hear it, you know, you hear it, hear the Muslims saying something similar, obviously the Catholics and, and many others. And but many modern evangelicals are bringing in a workspace salvation secretly through the back door and pretending that it's by faith alone. And that's what makes it so dangerous. They're lying. They're false teachers, they're false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And we hear the repent of sins heresy from, you know, false teachers like Ray Discomfort, John MacArthur, Paul Washer, and others. And well, if you want to go to hell, do nothing. Don't commit fornication. Don't commit adultery. Don't get addicted to alcohol. Don't do all the drugs and all the cigarettes. If you want to go to hell, do nothing, okay? You don't have to carry on sinning to go to hell. If you want to say that you have to turn from your sins to be saved, don't say that you believe in faith alone. Don't say that you believe that salvation is a gift from God. <clears throat> by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So the way of truth, they'll make it evil. They'll call it things like easy believism, or they'll call you Andersonites, or one, two, three, repeat after me, or cheap grace. It's not cheap, is it? It's not cheap, it's Jesus Christ gave himself for us. Cheap grace, they try and call it as well. We well, you know that you gotta do any work at all, cheap grace. No, your works are cheap. That's what's cheap. I'll give this example on the door recently. It's been helping a bit with some people. I've been saying, just imagine, and especially when they got a nice front door, front window, I said, just imagine my son now. I say, picked up a rock and just smashed it through your window, yeah? Just trashed it, yeah? What do you think that's worth? And, you know, a lot of the time these things are, you know, big bay windows, maybe a thousand odd pounds or something. And I said, imagine you then said to me, look, I'm going to forgive you. I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm going to forgive your son. Don't worry about it. It's cool. Let's just leave it. I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to do that. It's my gift to you. It's a free gift. I'm going to do that. And I said to them, yeah, but let me at least give you 50p. That is what's cheap, isn't it? That's cheap. And that's what these people are doing. They're, they're pathetic attempts at works to get saved. They're turning from sin. It's like offering 50p. In fact, it's much worse than that. But that's an example I try and give to people. More and more, we're seeing work salvation creep in. A salvation where there's something that I have to do to somehow earn the right to be saved or somehow be qualified to be saved through my own righteousness, through some goodness about myself or through some kind of a turning over of a new leaf or, or something like that. And they'll attack people who believe like us and call us easy believism. Yes, it's easy to be saved. Yes, all you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did the hard part when he died on the cross for our sins. We just have to believe. And it's easy to receive a gift, isn't it? It's easy to eat a piece of bread like Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. It's easy to open a door as he said, I'm the door. If any man shall enter in by me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. It's easy to take a drink of water. He said, if you drink of the water that I give you, he said, it'll spring up in you a well uh, springing unto everlasting life. 
It's easy to be safe. They'll also call it this. I heard this again just out sold in the last few weeks. Cheap grace. That's what someone told us when we're out sold. They said, oh, you believe in cheap grace. Right. Who's ever heard that term? Put up your hand. Right. Cheap, cheap grace. Let me tell you something. The blood of Jesus Christ is not cheap. Amen. And that's what I'm relying on for my salvation. Jesus Christ's dead, burial, and resurrection wasn't cheap. It was the most precious thing that's ever existed on this earth. What's cheap is those who believe that their good works are getting them right. That's cheap. Okay, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. And again, ultimately, these guys are trusting in their works. They turned from sin. They wanted to give up sin. They stopped certain sins. Verse 23. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And they do work iniquity, not only in their self-righteousness, but they're damning people to hell. They're damning people to hell. When you listen to those messages, what, are you, what do you take from that? When you're listening to those messages, there are people listening to that and just thinking, I've got to repent of my sin. And they're either refusing to even look in any further because they can't give up their sin. Or they think they're saved because they've given up certain sins. And most of the time they don't read the Bible, they don't realize how many sins, how many sins there are. I mean, it is amazing that anyone thinks that they can give up their sins. It's impossible. The Bible says it. You can't do it. That's why Jesus Christ came. And this is why it's so wicked. So this is why people need to make a stand. And they do need to make a stand. Here's what upsets me is that when people say, you know, oh, you believe that all you have to do is believe and get saved and that's it. Yeah, well, why don't we just go murder and rob and rape and pillage? And this is what I think to myself. I'm saved and I've never thought that. <laughs> and I feel like I'm like, is that what you want to do? Because I've never wanted to do something like that. Rob, rape. You know, it's like I got saved, you know, July 22nd, 2007. It's just like, all right, time to go rob a liquor store. <laughs> time to go murder that one dude I never really liked. The thought never even came into my mind, my friends. Such a weird example to give. And there's plenty of people in this room there's plenty of people in churches that believe in the right salvation that have never had that thought ever come into their mind it's typically the repenting your sins crowd <laughs> that has that thought because they're the ones who came up with the illustration out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh my friends and guess what out of the heart proceed evil thoughts murders thefts adulteries now look we as christians we have to repent of our sins all the time you know what Perhaps you have a sin in your life that you keep on committing over and over again, right? Wouldn't you say you should repent of that? But that has nothing to do with salvation. Now look, don't anybody twist my sermon. I'm not saying that you should be drinking or living with your girlfriend or smoking pot. Those are all things that you should repent of. Yeah. But remember back in the... You should go to church. You should read the Bible. You should tithe. You should go soul winning. You should help the poor. But do, is that how you get saved? No. Because no. those are all good works. Notice the word good. Good works. Yeah. We're not against works. We're not against repenting of your sins. In fact, I just spent several minutes praising Simon for repenting of his sin. But you know what? When it comes to salvation, it's faith. It's belief. Amen. But yet people will pull out Acts 17.30. Here's the proof that you got to repent of your sins to be saved. It isn't there. Well, yeah, but isn't that idolatry a sin? You know what my answer is to this? Isn't idolatry a sin? My answer is avoid foolish questions. Amen. And let me put that into modern vernacular. Avoid stupid questions. Because that is, that is a stupid question. Because any mathematician who knows anything about logic would know that that is illogical to say that, well, if you have to repent of believing in a false god... If a false god is a sin, then therefore you have to repent of your sin. Look, and, and you know, this might go over the head of some of the people in the auditorium. Who in here knows a lot about math or you're a computer programmer of some kind? Or you put up your hand if you're a computer geek or a, or a math. Hey, don't put your hand down just because I had a geek. No, I'm saying computer, computer geek, math nerds out there. I'm guilty. I'm one of them. Okay. And this, you know, hopefully everybody understands what I'm saying. Look. Idolatry, everybody, turn on your math brain for a second, okay? 
Idolatry does not equal sin. Idolatry is a subset of sin. Who understood what I just said? Okay. So, you know, uh, unbelief is not equal to sin. Unbelief is a subset of sin. Therefore, all unbelief is sin, but not all sin is unbelief. They're not equivalent. Let me put it to you in a way that, that might be simpler. Cat equal. This is the logic. Cat equals mammal. Dog equals mammal. Therefore, cat equals dog. Stupid, isn't it? <laughs> you must repent of bowing down to a statue and thinking it's God to be saved. Bowing down to a statue and thinking it's God is a sin. Therefore, you have to repent of your sin to be saved. <laughs> Salvation is described by God in absolutes. What does that mean? Is that he describes justification as one event that happens and it's settled, it's done. No more revisiting it. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. I mean, that, that's kindergarten terms right there. Right? He that believeth hath eternal life. He that believeth not shall not see life. What's going to happen to them? The wrath of God abideth in them. Pretty simple. The Bible is clear. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Salvation is a gift from God. It is without works. For by the obedience of one, many were made righteous. Absolutely. Those of us who are saved Christians should turn from our wicked ways so that God will hear our prayers and forgive our sins and heal our land. Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. Nevertheless, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. I hope that this documentary has edified you to gain a better understanding of repentance for salvation. No Nonsense Christianity offers other study videos and will continue to offer more, aiming to help you with various passages in the Bible in regards to salvation, including the more difficult passages. You may have noticed that most of the preachers featured in this documentary, as representing the correct side of the issue, believe in faith alone and eternal security. The only outlier was Michael Pearl, who believes that faith must produce works, or it isn't saving faith, based on the same interpretation of James 2 that all unsaved people, across all denominations, all share. Although he denies Lordship salvation, that is essentially the Lordship position. In his sermon, Dead Works, Dead Faith and Dead Believers, he insisted that saving faith must have obedience, and you cannot have faith without, quote, surrendering your life to the Lord Jesus, end quote, which is the ugly cousin of repent of your sins. If a man is dead in sin, how then shall he surrender his life, since he has nothing to bargain with? The true gospel is that Christ laid down his life for us. I still featured many of his clips on the repentance issue because I agreed with the points that he made and it was useful footage for this documentary. I am not the arbiter of his salvation, but I can only assume he too essentially believes in the repent of your sins to be saved gospel. He merely attacks the phraseology only or a specific interpretation of it. Because the only one who's able to keep all of God's commandments is God himself. This is why Jesus Christ came, because he fulfilled all the law and the prophets. That's why he's the worthy one. That's why he's the only one that can save us. Look at Romans 4. Well, I just think that if you believe on Jesus Christ, you should do good works, though. They should follow. You know, you should. Well, okay, you can believe that if you want, but that's not what the Bible teaches. Look at verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. All the works-based salvation, people hate this next verse. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Amen. Yeah, but you should have works. Okay, I give you that. You should have works. But if you don't, his faith is still counted for righteousness. Amen. Yeah, but I think that like if you're saved, it, it should cause you to just love the Lord in such a way that you do good works. Okay, whatever. <laughs> but if not. <laughs> well, don't you think that if someone really just loves God and they just love the Bible, that they're going to do, they're, they're going to want to do good works for God? Yeah. But <laughs> if they don't, 
his faith is still counted for righteousness. But what if his faith is still counted for righteousness? Because to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Amen. His works aren't counted for righteousness. The Bible says that our works are as filthy rags in the eyes of God. Amen. Look at John 6, verse 34. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. Why is he so extreme? I'll tell you why, because what he's referring to is salvation. And if you eat of this bread, referring to Jesus Christ, you'll never hunger. Now, he's not referring to like physical, because whoever ate bread during this time, they were still hungry thereafter. He's referring to the fact that he satiates the need for salvation. Will never hunger, he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I say unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. Look at verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And listen to this. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Now pay attention to that phrase, no wise. Does anybody know what that phrase means? It's not a phrase that we would commonly use today. What does no wise mean? In no way, under any circumstance, under any condition, for any reason. Yeah, but if you go, shut up! Under any reason whatsoever, I will never cast you out. That's what he's saying. If you're not really seeking the Lord on your knees every day in prayer and reading his word, then you're not ever going to get to full surrender. You're not ever going to be. Shut up. Under any reason whatsoever, I will never cast you out. A person is justified by works and not by faith. Shut up. His faith is still counted for righteousness. Because to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. That is the first part of the gospel. Repent and then believe the good news. Shut up! Under any reason whatsoever, I will never cast you out. It happens when we turn from sins turn from shut up they, they, that their works that they turn from their evil way when god saw those works shut up we cannot go on sinning we cannot have a sin for life shut up you know you're trying to do works we don't have to do anything because we're saved by grace that is pure and other nonsense shut up his faith is still counted for righteousness we are not justified by faith alone absolutely not shut up confess your sins Confess and forsake his Shut up! Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Shut up! What is repentance? Repentance is that sinner forsakes his sin that Shut up! Is repentance, metanoia, turning away from our sins. Shut up! Well, the Holy Spirit is giving evidences that you are the child of God. And the first evidence I'm pointing to is Shut up! His faith is still counted for righteousness. If we are doing good works in the name of Jesus, but we still have some sin in our life. Shut up! Well, like Paul, we've... Shut up! But I'm saved when I understand how beautiful he is and surrender every... Shut up! So what are you repenting of? Your sin. Shut up! Is to repent, to turn from your sin. Shut up! You gotta turn from what you love. You gotta turn from your sins. You gotta count the cost. Shut up! Salvation is not believing a bunch of stuff about Christ. Shut up! I use repentance as turning from sin because... Shut up! Die for sinners! You hear us? Shut up! When I repented of my sin, I changed my... Shut up! His faith is still counted for righteousness.